Welcome to the Think Yourself Healthy podcast, where we challenge you to think differently about your approach to health and wellness. My name is Heather Duranja, and I'm excited to be here with you to take you on the journey from surviving to thriving. Hello, everybody. On today's show of Think Yourself Healthy, we have a very special guest, Jennifer Fugo. She is a regist- or a clinical nutritionist empowering women who've been failed by conventional medicine to beat chronic skin and unending gut challenges. Because she's overcome a long history of gut issues and eczema, Jennifer has empathy and insight to help her clients discover missing pieces and create doable integrative plans. She holds a master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport, Bridgeport and is a licensed dietitian nutritionist and a certified nutrition specialist. Her work has been featured on Dr. Oz, Reuters, Yahoo, CNN, and many podcasts and summits. Jennifer is a faculty member of the Learn Skin platform, an Amazon best-selling author, and the host of the Healthy Skin Show. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jennifer. I'm really excited to have a chat with you. I know that I get questions all the time about skin issues. That tends to be the driving factor for a lot of clients to take action on seeking help. So I love what you do. I love the content and the material you put out. You guys, if you aren't following her on Instagram, you must go follow. She just puts out so much valuable information. So again, thank you for being with us, Jennifer. Well, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be on your show and to, you know, I'm hoping too that we can answer some questions that will really help your audience today, you know, and fill in some of the blanks and give them at least a starting point of where to begin either taking some action steps or Mm -hmm. to dig in areas that they have never considered before. That's, that's really my goal was to say like, Hey, you know, I think the issues with our skin are not always just about our skin. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of things deeper than that. And that's, that's what I like to help illuminate for people Mm -hmm. who are really struggling and not getting any results just like with the steroid creams and everything. Yeah. I feel so sorry for all of the people who have to um, chronically use steroids and creams to treat their conditions. Jennifer, can you explain to the audience what is really driving skin irritations and skin problems today? I can. It's just a lot more complicated than what most people think. So um, let me actually share a little bit of my story. That way it might help as an example. I would love Um, So I think what a lot of people go through is that you have this rash that pops up on your skin like I did. I ended up with these weird bumps and like this rash that was very cyclical in nature and would burn and itch and drive me crazy and kept spreading on my hands. And so I went to the dermatologist, right? We go to the dermatologist. We're like, hey, doc, what is this? Like, do you have something to make it stop? Uh And so, yeah, they usually have steroid cream. Steroid cream is usually the first suggestion that is made. And while that's great because steroid cream inherently like kind of blocks inflammation and that inflammatory process, it gets things to calm down. But if, if it's not just like a one-time event, like, oh, I was wearing a watch that I happened to be sensitive to that nickel that was in the watch, but it's something happening deeper, that steroid cream is only going to work for a period of time. And then you're going to notice that the rash comes back and it may come back worse. It may flare worse. It may start showing up in other places. And so what I saw was this rash that started inside of my middle finger on my right hand and began to like, it almost looked like it was like slowly like an amoeba, like Mm -hmm. crawling up my fingers and going into the webbing and then down onto my palms. And like, it, it just was really, really crazy that I couldn't get it to stop. And every time the flare cycle would happen, it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I could not touch anything. I couldn't wash my hands. I couldn't touch water because water burned. So it wasn't even that I couldn't use soap. God, oh my gosh. Could you imagine now with like all the craziness going on with wash your hands, wash your hands, people with hand eczema or rashes on their hands, that's a major problem because you can't wash it. Like water burns. Um, And so my doctor said, here's some steroid cream and oh, put some Vaseline on top to keep the moisture in. Now, 
from a practical standpoint, I don't want Vaseline all over my house. From a more health standpoint, I recognize that from, from like a medical perspective, Vaseline is sit, considered to be relatively safe and it doesn't really do much. Yes, it's a petrochemical byproduct and all this stuff. So like I wasn't too crazy about that, but just even from a practical standpoint, mm-hmm. I was like, no, it's not going to work. Right. I ended up wearing gloves all day. Like I, I just, I got to the point where I couldn't shake people's hands. I couldn't cook. I couldn't do a lot of very basic things. And, and that was just in my hands. Can you imagine if this impacts your face mm-hmm. or it impacts your feet? You can't walk. Some people can't walk. You start having rashes in weird places and a lot of people feel a great amount of shame. And so steroid creams and antibiotics tend to be like the first two areas where you you may see like a prescription around those. Um, Antibiotics specifically, if you have like an overgrowth of say strep or staph on the skin, um, and sometimes it's candida or fungal related, and they can tell the difference by doing a culture of what it is. But as you get deeper into this and things don't work or they're not working enough or you're really suffering and their dermatologist wants to try and help you, but they're not sure, they're going to start recommending biologic drugs. And this is where you have to start asking yourself some hard questions because biologic drugs block inflammatory biochemical pathways. But the question we never ask is like, what happens when you shut that pathway off? Like, And where is the inflammation coming from in the first place? Because it's not just at your skin, which we can dive into deeper later. Mm -hmm. The reason I say this, and you know, and then there's immunosuppressants, and that's a whole other (laughs) that's a whole other thing that can really scare people. But the thing that I discovered in the process of addressing my own eczema and then working with clients was that we really need to look deeper. It's not just an outside in approach. It's not just your skin. Your skin is really like the check engine light of your car. It's saying, Hey, there's a problem. Yes, there could be a problem on the surface. That is legitimately possible, but also, there's likely a problem internally. Mm-hmm. And so we need to look inside as well as outside. And the reason is that there are actually 16 root causes, at least that I have sort of uncovered. And I talk about a lot um, over on my website in the Healthy Skin Show. I'll just rattle them off real quick. So there's microbiome dysbiosis, gut dysfunction, diet and food reactions, nutritional deficiencies, liver detox challenges, trauma, unmanaged stress, genetic issues or SNPs that can be involved with this, thyroid dysfunction, hormone imbalances like estrogen dominance, autoimmunity, drug reactions, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, heavy metals, environmental toxins, and environmental allergens like pollen, allergies, and dander. So, okay, so that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot. Right? Yes. And for somebody who hears at least they're like, maybe on one hand you're like, oh, there's something else here that I need to investigate. But then you're like, on the other hand, oh my goodness, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Where do I start? Because it's a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I've discovered in my clinical practice, because I do work with cl- clients all over the world, is that usually people have some combo of these, like usually somewhere between three to five. So you don't Oh, like, don't go, oh my gosh, heavy metals is on the list. I must have heavy metal toxicity. Like, Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the case. Not everyone has that issue. Not everyone has issues with environmental um, allergens, Mm -hmm. right? I don't. Other clients don't. Um, So what's important is to start drilling down to figure out what your combo is. That way you can focus on those things. And this also is important because it may help explain why, say, Susie over here did X, Y, and Z for her skin, and oh my gosh, in two weeks or a month, she's completely better. But Mm -hmm. you tried it, and it didn't work. And the reason is that her root causes may be very different from yours, even though all of the symptoms, all of the complaints are the same. Mm -hmm. You both have eczema, or you both have psoriasis, or whatever, but it just doesn't work for you. And so that's why I think it's important to let people know that you're not a failure because all of these other treatments or ideas or remedies work for other people. And you're not, you're not failing. Your body's not like trying to hijack you because it's not cooperating with these different things. It's just not the right fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
you know, I think that a lot of people who go on to Google and they potentially will see that list, they will assume the worst, right? Yeah. Heavy metal toxicity. And then they will Google how to get rid of heavy metal toxicity. And this is where I think it gets really, really problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, and people need to be very cautious with the approaches that they decide to take based on seeing, you know, a very expansive list of potential mm -hmm. causes. So for the listener out there who is struggling and they're like, oh my God, there could be all of these different things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How would you professionally direct them to start going through and basically eliminating what the potential causes could be? Okay. So that's a, that's a great question, by the way. Um, the first thing is that most people who have chronic skin issues fixate on either diagnosis and specifically their diagnosis yeah. or just their skin, mm -hmm. right? So they're like, I have eczema. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you have eczema, but the way your eczema showed up in mine is different. So I want to know exactly what are the, 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 details, the experiences mm -hmm. of your eczema. Does it burn? Is it red? Does it dry? Um, does it ooze? Like, tell me all of the details, like the dirty, gross, like tell me it all because that's important. You don't just have eczema. Right. Also, and equally, somebody may say, well, I have numular eczema or I have dyshydrotic eczema. Mm -hmm. Those are different. That's all well and good. It's nice to know that, but like at the end of the day, that doesn't impact um, how you would then go through and deal with root causes, right? We again get stuck in that diagnosis right. symptom management state and we want to take a step back. Mm -hmm. And then equally, people who are just stuck at the level of looking at their skin, like, oh, but I have a rash. I'm like, that's great. But what else is going on in your body? Because your body is one whole complete being. Right. Everything is connected. I mean, I just rattled off a list of 16 different things that yeah. could drive your skin issues, which means that like, I'll give you an example. The other day I was consulting with this woman who has, she knows for sure she has um, yeast rashes because she had gone to the dermatologist and they had cultured them. And I was like, is this it? And she's like, oh, well, I'm kind of constipated, but like, it's not a big deal. And I was like, what's not a big deal? And she's like, well, I go to the bathroom like every four days. And I was like, excuse me? Yeah. So as we kept digging, it, we, it came out that not only is she incredibly constipated, which is a gut dysfunction issue, she also had gas and bloating. Mm -hmm. She wasn't eating a sufficient amount of calories. The food that she was eating was highly processed every single day. So she likely wasn't getting enough nutrients out of her food to even make anything. And a lot of things in her body work. A lot of people don't realize our bodies do not make nutrients. We are not nutrient making factories. Yeah, we make niacin. That's well and good. But like niacin is not going to be like the thing that saves you. Right. So it's imperative that we don't fixate on. Like my body's just going to do it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like going to save itself. That's not the case. We need nutrients that come in from the outside, but it's not just what you eat because you can eat an amazing, stellar, organic, grass-fed, what have you, all those labels, diet and you're not absorbing any of it. So right. you're not what you eat, you are what you absorb. So it's important to know what's in the food and then are you able to absorb it? And then what happens to that food when it interacts with your microbiome? Because that can really set off this whole chaotic mess as well. So I, that's where I say you have to get outside of the skin. You have to say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to put aside the judgments that I've had with like conventional medicine of where they go, oh, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Stop saying that to yourself right. and allow yourself to basically put down on a piece of paper every single symptom that you have. Even things that you think are kind of odd or weird or somebody says are strange about yourself. You know, maybe you get weird headaches. Maybe your hair is falling out and you feel like it's gotten really thin. Maybe you have a weird metal taste in your mouth. Um, I've had clients that have like, like, you know, they've got itching in all sorts of strange spots that they're embarrassed to talk about. They right. have foot fungus and toe fungus or nail fungus on the toes. And, um, you know, just 
yeast infections, um, anything, anywhere, even like mood issues, like flying off the handle. And you don't even know why you get, go into these rages. Right. But we're looking at your whole body, your whole system and saying, okay, well, if we consider that symptoms aren't just there to, to annoy you, mm-hmm. and they're actually there as sort of the check engine lights of your car, and all of these different things are happening now, and we start to piece them together, that can help us either find root causes or identify best testing to look for root causes, figure out what those are, and start addressing them. So they're really communication signals from your body. It just, it, we're not, we don't have a handbook. We don't come into this world going, oh, I know what a headache means. Right. Like I, a lot of people don't realize that co- being constipated can also indicate that you have, you potentially have low magnesium. Mm-hmm. Um, and And so anyway, that's my long-winded story of just saying like, you need to really get clear on all of the symptoms and be really nitty gritty. Don't go, oh, well that I have psoriasis. This doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. I work with people who have eczema, psoriasis, hives, dandruff, lichen sclerosis, uh, tinea versicolor, rosacea. Yeah. I mean, this is how we piece things together. Mm Mm-hmm. I love it. Thank you for the very thorough and expansive explanation. I think it was definitely necessary. I think that a lot of times um, we don't realize that it's going to take a lot for something to really present on the outside. Mm-hmm. And so if we are having extensive issues on the outside, that's a good indication that there are a lot of things on the inside that have been in dysfunction for quite some time Mm -hmm. that have now allowed for this to present on the outer body, waving its flag, you know, hey, I need your attention. Do you not notice me over here? And so a lot of times for women, it does take that to get them to want to take action because we're so, um, you know, mindful of our appearance and our complexion. We hold such value there. And I know that this, I work with a lot of autoimmune um, disease women. And so unfortunately with autoimmune, there typically is some sort of skin issue that also resides with all of the other plethora of things that they have going on. But it's typically that skin or hair falling out Mm -hmm. that gets them to finally take the action. And, you know, usually they do a lot of like over the counter type of, right. They go through the list and they're like, oh, it's, it's this one. I'll try that. No, it's this one. And then they're so freaking confused and self-defeated that, you know, um, they just feel like there's nowhere to turn. There's, there's no Mm -hmm. hope. I can give you a little story. When my youngest daughter, um, was after I stopped breastfeeding, my youngest daughter broke out in eczema head to toe, like head to toe. And this last, well, she still has it technically, but, um, you know, we took her to the doctor. We did all of the testing, hydrocortisone, steroid creams were the only treatment. Hers was so bad that like literally layers of skin would just peel mm-hmm. off and then it would come be the new skin was just completely white, like very, lots of, you know, dispigmentation. And she was in a ton of pain and she was just this tiny baby. So we did the typical allergy testing, you know, let's see, this must be an allergy and everything came up negative. And then about two years ago, we were able to get her food intolerance testing and we were um, able to identify that she has a wheat, dairy, and chickpea intolerance, which are the same ones I have, ironically. And once we were able to start eliminating those foods from the diet, her skin started just naturally getting better. But what we discovered over this last, you know, 19 year journey is that her anxiety and stress are the triggers. So the anxiety and stress are the triggers. If she's eating foods that are difficult for her body to break down, that's just another stressor that's triggering the response. Um, And then she's worrying about her skin. So that's another trigger that's you know, contributing to the response. And so I feel for individuals out there who, um, you know, 
don't have the knowledge like you mm -hmm. and I have, and they don't know where to begin because it does feel devastating for them. I know how much my, both of my daughters have suffered with their skin issues and it's really had a negative impact on their self-confidence, all of the, um, you know, emotional components of their being, judgment, shame, all of these things, confusion, and that's a lot to carry at a young age. So for the 19 year old listening right now who is struggling and looking in the mirror and they see that their face is just completely broke out, they're on the birth control pill, they, you know, cause it's supposed to help with the acne um, and they're not getting in any improvement. What do you suggest to them? Where do they go? Well, I think the first thing, uh, the most obvious thing is um, and a lot of people kind of discount this, but you got to clean up your diet first. I mean, acne is sort of a different, a little bit of a different beast than eczema and psoriasis in that it can be impacted by um, growth factors and all sorts of things. So that's why a lot of times dairy is not necessarily your friend. End. It really do struggle with that. However, birth control pills, one interesting facet of them, which actually my, my colleague and friend, Dr. Jolene Brighton talks a lot about, and uh, her book Beyond the Pill is an excellent resource for anybody struggling with that, um, is that birth control pills actually increase the amount of essentially sugar, glucose that we have inside our GI tract and the vaginal cavity. So it increases and encourages the grow, overgrowth of yeast. But a lot of times too, if people have had acne, they've been on a lot of antibiotics first. And so they may have also been on Accutane and then they end up on birth control. So all of these skew the microbiome and that doesn't even touch on what infections they may have had earlier in life, like strep or mono or chicken pox or anything else like mm -hmm. that. So a lot of times, by the way, if somebody's listening, if you've had strep, that's an important thing to be able to tell a practitioner because a lot of times strep still can hang out, especially if you have psoriasis, strep can actually mm -hmm. trigger psoriasis. Um, and so that, that would be the thing I'd say is like, first, you got to clean up your diet. Um, the second thing is to start considering why you're taking all these medications and then looking internally. I mean, for me, I use a lot of um, comprehensive stool testing mm -hmm. in my practice because I want to know what's going on with the microbiome and gut function. And um, is there inflammation within the GI tract? Because to me, I really work hard. So I probably work differently than a lot of uh, clinical nutritionists. Well, a lot of times people are just like, here's a diet, follow this diet. And for me, I really try to minimize the amount of foods restricting from their diet. And the reason is that we've perpetuated this excessive state of orthorexia mm -hmm. where people become increasingly afraid of food, thinking that like just taking out more and more foods is going to fix their issue. And I unfortunately have worked with a lot of people who've tried every single diet in the book and don't even know what the heck to eat anymore. Right. And so for me, like I want to see what's actually like what's going on? As I said, we're not what we eat. We are what we absorb. Uh, and so if we're missing nutrients, if, we have, if we're feeding proteins, which are not broken down because say we don't have enough stomach acid, and now it's feeding gut bugs, that process is called putrefaction, which is it produces very toxic byproducts that are absorbed through the gut lumen mm -hmm. and end up in your bloodstream. And so a, you're feeding the microbiome, and B, you're making expensive poop. Right. So we want well, to correct that. Yeah, and if we're not pooping regu regularly mm -hmm. and that is sitting in the bowels, we're just reabsorbing those toxins into the bloodstream, and then they like to hang out in adipose tissue, and then they make it you know, more resistant to being broken down, and so people really struggle with weight loss as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to I wanna go back. When you were talking about food restriction, I am not a believer in food restriction unless it is absolutely necessary. Um, so even for myself, I have you know, three very, very significant food intolerances that have very negative uh, symptoms for me. And I still eat them. I'm just mindful of the things that are going to occur and have to take that into perspective so that I can talk nicely to myself instead of beating myself <laughs> up when my stomach blows up and I'm having, you know, excessive diarrhea or I start breaking out in rashes. Um, and sometimes it, it even presents in like projectile vomiting. Like it's, you know, but I still want the cake, right? I'm like, I, st I just want the cake. But um, I'm picky and choosy about that. 
But back to the point with food restriction, we're stressing over what we can't have because a lot of the times we're eliminating a lot of the foods that we do enjoy and even healthy foods that we enjoy because yeah. we think that they're a problem. And then that's contributing to fear. And then the fear is creating more stress, more stress. because we're second yeah. guessing everything that we're putting in our mouth. And this is just exacerbating the problem. It's just contributing to the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. And my friends over at Organifi are hooking you up with 15% off the entire store. Yep, the entire store. All you have to do is head over to Organifi.com and use the code Heather to save some moolah. You guys ask me all the time, Heather, how do you have so much energy? How are you basically reversing the aging process? And I just have to say that the green juice and the red juice from Organifi are two of my secrets. I don't go a single day without a scoop of my red or green juice. And just a little PSA, right now they even have a pumpkin spice flavor and um, it's outrageous. I don't take a lot of supplements, but I'll be honest, it's hard to get a lot of the vitamins and minerals we need from food alone these days. So that's why I use a high quality product like Organifi to ensure that I'm supporting my brain health, liver health, immune system, detoxification, and most importantly, my energy levels. The green juice is amazing first thing in the morning because it contains superfoods that help to lower cortisol levels. And uh, it's 2020, has it got you stressed? This is going to be a game changer for you to help reset your entire body for a focused and energized day. To have your red or green juice or any other amazing Organifi product delivered to your doorstep, head to Organifi.com and use the code Heather for 15% off. And it also depletes the amount of nutrients because if the smaller your diet gets, the fewer the nutrients oh, available 100%. to you. So Absolutely. lower diversity of food equals lower diversity of the microbiome. Um, that go, we know that for sure. So um, that's why it's really important to make sure that, you know, for my first, I have this really interesting graphic that I shared on Instagram and that I share with my community. It's about the hierarchy of like, where do you start dealing with things in the first two spots, which is most foundational, right? You were saying like, oh my gosh, heavy metals. Well, heavy metals is like way at the top. That's like, you don't start there. You have to make sure that you can, you can actually get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So that means that that gut function is incredibly crucial mm -hmm. as is liver detox, um, our liver detox pathways. And I'm not talking that about that people have to do a detox of their liver. I think that that has gotten really overused. And I think actually for a lot of people with skin issues, it makes things worse because, and, and the other reason why is that if you have a, like a more histamine presentation, right? So you have asthma, allergies, super itchy. Um, and that happens a lot more with like usually eczema than like psoriasis, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the liver, very common liver detox herbs like milk thistle, mm -hmm. dandelion root, burdock, um, those kind of things actually are cross-reactive with some very common pollen allergies like ragweed. Mm -hmm. And so that's one problem. So you may inadvertently be triggering more allergic issues, more histamine by doing those. And then number two, a lot of those just push things further and faster through phase one detox in our liver, but it doesn't support phase two. And so my whole thing is like, we need to support phase two. And then phase three is really the clearance of how do right. we get those toxins out of the system right. through urination, sweat, um, bowel movements, et cetera. That's where those two pieces really come together is that phase two deto liver detox and then digestive function. Let's right. get it out. Well, I think the liver does an amazing job of getting all of the toxic stuff to the liver, but unfortunately that second phase of detoxification that you're talking about, one of the biggest problems is that we just lack the nutrients that are needed in order to yeah. start doing the, the second phase of that detox um, in order to get to the third. So with that being said, let's talk about how a lot of these steroid medications inhibit the liver's ability to um, 
process things efficiently. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on in the liver whenever we are using these kind of um, medications as the solution? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that on one hand, like you have to consider your overall load, right? Mm -hmm. So we have our daily normal load of, of toxins that we're exposed to in our environment. Um, could be pesticides, could be solvents, chemicals, fumes, all sorts of stuff in the exterior environment. But then we forget that there are things that the liver has to do every day and every moment in order to keep us alive. Um, we, it actually is tasked with converting our hormones, our, our steroid sex hormones, one to the other, and with estrogen, turning it off and sending it up through bile and getting it out of the system. Mm. So there's a lot of basic stuff it has to do. However, if you have microbiome, gut, specifically microbiome dysbiosis in your GI tract, whether it's SIBO, CIFO, hidden infections, you just have like a real imbalance. I call it, sometimes there's overgrowth in the large intestine and a lot of my friends would call it LIBO, large intestine bacterial overgrowth. But your body has to deal with those waste products. Some of them are excreted, but some of them pass through the single cell lining of the gut and they end up at your liver. Your liver has got to deal with it. So what happens now if you've got really unfriendly bugs? Well, that's a huge load on top of what it's already supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then you add in other drugs that may also impact what's happening. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is specifically with steroid creams is steroid and hydrocortisone. It doesn't matter whether it is the stuff your doctor prescribed or it's over the counter. So like cortisone 10 or something you buy at the pharmacy that's, you know, the store brand. Um, that is actually cortisol, our hormone cortisol that's made by our adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. And um, so one problem that we're increasingly seeing with people who, especially in the skin world, who have been, uh, they've been given basically free reign mm -hmm. to use as much steroid cream as they want for an extended period of time is that, and especially if you've got asthma, then you're using an inhaler that has a steroid. And then what if you're using other types of like nasal sprays that have steroids, that people are getting this overabundance exposure to steroid creams that actually hijacks their adrenals in the sense that your adrenals are like, well, I don't need to do my job. I don't need to produce cortisol. Right. And so with time, what can happen is people can start to develop. So I think it's kind of tricky because well, what happens if you're really just taking the medication or lilipredmone or, you know, inhaling it or what have you, but they call it topical steroid withdrawal. And this can happen to any type of skin condition where your body literally becomes addicted mm -hmm. to the topical steroid because that's its main source of cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so you start to see the rash spread or a flare. I'm going to put that in air quotes because a flare I feel like is an overused term sometimes and people let, let things go too long. Mm -hmm. But the flare starts to spread everywhere. You get rashes in places you never had. Your hair starts falling out. You can't sleep at night. You become incredibly depressed. You're crying all the time. You can't control your emotions. You can't control your body temperature. You can't exercise. You can't all of a sudden you feel literally like a crazy person and the doctors don't believe you. They keep handing you more steroids and you just don't feel well. And so unfortunately this isn't a, a diagnosis as of yet. That's just what it's called. Um, and so there's a great website. If anyone is listening to this going, Oh wait, uh, go head on over to itsan.org, I-T-S-A-N.org. There's also a really great documentary. Um, called Preventable by Brianna Banos. It's actually free on YouTube to watch. And that can really help you sometimes piece together clues of what's going on. Because at that point, adding in more steroid cream mm -hmm. or steroids in, in general is probably making things worse. Mm -hmm. So there is unfortunately this huge gap in knowledge mm -hmm. about what's happening with steroids because it's not a specific drug. It's, it's just this class. Um, and some people have been on steroids for like their whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it becomes really hard to get off of them. So it's important not to go cold turkey. If you are having these issues, um, you talk with your doctor and your practitioners about them because there are some things they can do to support you. But I've had clients with TSW who have been tested by their doctors for all sorts of weird, random, almost even genetic 
they didn't, the doctor had no idea what was happening. And even my client figured out what was happening. The doctor was like, oh, that's nonsense. It's not a thing. And so they're really left struggling. There are some also uh, tcmdermatology.org, I think, is another great website of dermatologists that um, have a really good understanding of how to handle uh, TSW. Um, but there's a lot of complications that can happen with medications for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And, um, and so you just want to be mindful of that. And it can happen to people who aren't even don't need the med. It's moms who rub it on their kids. You right. can actually get it mm -hmm. because you have it the exposure on your hands. Yeah. So thank you so much for bringing all of that up. I think that's such valuable information to share. Um, I learned new things in there. So thank you. And the resources are amazing. So we appreciate mm -hmm. you sharing those as well. Um, gosh, yeah, I, 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 like you, um, have seen people who have been on steroids for 40, 50, 60 years, and they, they're they really in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's a shame to see them suffering so much. And like you said, they go to the doctor and then they get gaslit. Huh? It's all in your head. You don't have anything. We can't figure it out. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, this is just too much. So yeah, gosh. Um, so let's go back to talking about um, histamine. I want to talk about okay. histamine. So I see, I see a lot of people out there who are um, being recommended to fall histamine diets. What is, how, what is histamine? How does histamine have an impact on all of this in terms of how it presents with our skin? Talk to me about that. Yes. So histamine is it's, it's kind of like a neurotransmitter, basically. It's a, it's um, it's one of the things that our body produces, specifically mast cells. They're like little, they're like little factories. They float around the body, and when they're agitated, something happens. They become destabilized and dump histamine in the, into the system. And so, some people have more of a histamine presentation than others. I do want to clarify. So, itching is usually one of the hallmarks of like everybody thinks, "Oh, I'm really super itchy. I must have a histamine issue." Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily the case. If you have itchiness, it can either be histamine, it could be liver detox overload, that phase two liver detox overload, or it can be hidden infections. Mm -hmm. So it. It could be all three, but you yeah. know, that's why I think sometimes people get stuck in thinking it's just this one thing and that's not the case. So histamine is, we can take in foods that are high histamine foods like vinegars and fermented foods like sauerkraut and wine and all that jazz. There are also these are all, other foods. These are all fermented foods that are so good for your gut. What do you mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so a lot of times if somebody has a histamine picture, like a real clear histamine picture, I'm like, yeah, we're probably going to have to like put those aside. I try not to go too deep into the list unless it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. But there are other healthy foods like avocados, for example, are considered a high histamine food. So again, I try not to go too deep, but the typically what I find is there's a combo, right? So the liver is overloaded from everything that's going on. There mm -hmm. could be certain bugs hiding in the system that are also releasing histamines or triggering the release of histamine. H. pylori is one of them. It's a corkscrew bacteria that is a very, such a common infection, about 50 to 60% of the world's population have it. And believe it or not, 30 to 35% who have it don't even know they have it. They have no wow. symptoms at all. Wow. And so, um, and if you have it, if you have it, you have to suspect out to because it's passed back and forth via saliva. So oh, if you have I did it, I not know you, that. Yes. So a lot of times I found with spouses, they'll get tested too, and, and, and there you go, they have it. So if wow. someone clears it, they can end up getting it back and reinfect themselves um, because of their spouse, unfortunately. So H. pylori is a, a big problem. It also reduces our stomach acid, which messes up gut function mm -hmm. and a bunch of other things. I got some. But, um, H. pylori, parasites can be an issue. Um, I also bacteria that produces histamines. Um, there are certain strains of like Klebsiella, like Klebsiella oxytoca, that produce histamines as well. And so that's one piece to this puzzle. Then you also have enzymes that are meant to break down histamine because histamine is important. I don't think we should demonize any one thing. It's just, it's a natural part of the body. It's important for 
it's important. It's, it, it actually is important. You don't want no histamine. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to be able to manage what your, what your load is. And so there's one enzyme in your gut called DAO. It's diamine oxidase. Um, that is, that's just in the gut. That's breaking down histamines that we intake through food and if, and what's being produced by bacteria. Mm -hmm. Then there's another enzyme that's in the tissue of the body for short is HNMT. <laughs> and so you can have a snip in HNMT. So that can be a problem. So you could just have a systemic issue breaking histamines down. But the real problem, the real concern that I oftentimes see with clients is that DAO can either, we can see a suppression of that, the production of this enzyme, right? And that can actually happen for a number of reasons. And some of those reasons, and this is really like <gasps> for somebody who's taking Benadryl mm -hmm. or Zyrtec and some of these other antihistamine medications for histamine, mm -hmm. they actually can suppress your body's ability to make DAO. So it's sort of cycle you get in where you start to become unable to break down histamines that are coming in through the GI tract. Um, and so I think some key things are to really get clear on, do you really have a histamine issue? Don't just assume you do because you're itchy and you have eczema. Not everybody does. Um, but if you do, then it's about figuring out what's filling up, I call it the histamine cup, what's filling it up and overwhelming your body's ability to be able to, to deal with it. Another big one that a lot of people don't realize is estrogen dominance also deprioritizes that DAO from being produced in your body. You can supplement with DAO, mm -hmm. um, but people who are vegan aren't super keen on that because it is it, the, the enzyme actually comes from pigs. And if you have an issue, like an allergy to pork, it's probably not a good idea to try that. Um, but it is a test you can do for, you know, um, two weeks to a month to see if it actually helps you. Okay. You can also reduce your histamine load through food. Um, but generally speaking, I, I mean, I try to say, okay, on a systemic level, where do we have, what do we have to do to slowly support your body to be less reactive? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, those are some big pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'll throw in there too for some natural stuff because that's what uh -huh. everybody wants to know. Right. Nettles can be really helpful. Quercetin is great. Um, bio and black bioflavonoids. So like rutin and quercetin are two really great options. Um, they can really help support mast cells and help calm the system down. Nettles are amazing. They're a, an herb. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can either actually, sometimes you can find them outside. Otherwise you can, you can get them in their dried form and make teas and, or they have them encapsulated in supplements. Okay. <laughs> so ultimately the recommendation is if you are having itching and you think that you might have some sort of issue with histamine, don't just automatically assume and start utilizing the diet protocol for histamine management. Um, there's other things that we need to do before we go that route. Yeah. I mean, the big ones, I mean, to be honest, is it really that bad if you can't have alcohol and right. like maybe you just shift to lemon juice instead of your vinegar for a little while? Usually apple cider vinegar can be okay. Um, you know, maybe you just cut out the big red flags and see for a couple weeks, mm -hmm. you know, you should know within two weeks if okay. it's helping or not. It's not something that, Oh, it takes six months. You'll feel better the longer you're on it. It's not one of right. those things. And I've, I've had people that I've had conversations with where they're like, you know, in a discovery call and they're like, well, I've been following and, and my doctor said I needed to, my histamine levels were off and I needed to follow histamine diet. And, um, I've been doing this for two years and I haven't had any improvement, you know, and they're like, oh I've my. tried every, everything. And I'm yeah. like, oh, man. okay. I, I want to circle back to something cause you were asking me about the liver earlier and then yeah. we were talking about pooping and estrogen. Uh -huh. So, um, so I was saying how estrogen dominance mm -hmm. decreases DAO, that, mm -hmm. that really important enzyme. So one way we get estrogen dominance is that, um, as I was saying earlier, your, your liver is really, it's really important. If, if you take one thing away from this entire episode, yes. just take away from the fact that the liver does a lot of really important things. Yeah. And so it deactivates your estrogen, 
sends it up through your bile. When you eat, the gallbladder compresses, squirts everything out, and the deactivated estrogen floats down through your GI tract. And ultimately, we want to poop it out. That's how we get rid of and manage our estrogen levels. Right. But there are some bacteria. This is why oftentimes I utilize uh, comprehensive stool testing. Mm-hmm. There can be bacteria that contain an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. That enzyme reactivates the, uh, the deactivated estrogen. So it turns it back on and you reabsorb it. So the bugs hijack your estrogen detoxification Mm -hmm. and elimination. And so, so think about that. You have a gut problem that messes up your hormone balance. So now you've got high estrogen, high estrogen decreases the amount of DAO that you produce and then causes all these other symptoms on top of it. Now you become increasingly sensitive to all of these foods and things that have histamines in them. So it's just this vicious cycle. That's why I'm saying I'm not I don't want people to walk away going, oh, this is too complicated for me to figure out. But I do want you to understand that this is why oftentimes the diet only approach, if you're not getting results with, I'm going to tell you flat out, within two weeks to to a month, there's something else deeper going on here. Um, and, And the last thing I do want to just say is that sometimes your flare, where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm super itchy get really clear on what a skin infection looks like because I have had so many clients or even just people that are like, I'm really having a flare and I just want to sit down and talk to you. And I'm like, I think you have a skin infection. Like none of this other stuff is going to help you right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if your skin is oozing, if it's burning, if it's severely itchy, if it's red, um, go to the dermatologist or your doctor, ask them to do a culture. So they just swab the skin mm-hmm. and they'll culture it and they'll see what comes back. Because if you have a, like a staph infection, for example, right. which is one of the hallmarks of eczema, mm-hmm. there's no amount of nettles or antihistamines or even steroid creams. It's going to help that you need antibiotics. You have, that is like an emergency situation, especially because we don't want it to become so serious that you end up seri- like I should I should say that staff damages the skin barrier so tremendously mm-hmm. it is it produces such caustic toxins mm-hmm. that no wonder it is so uncomfortable so I understand and can appreciate people like being frustrated with their doctor. I do get that because I too was incredibly frustrated and I am oftentimes frustrated with other people's doctors and dermatologists, but that's another, that's a different conversation. The thing is sometimes you need them. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you say, Hey, Hey doc, um, my skin is, I, I can't sleep. You know, if that, say what's true for you, but you got to be clear. I can't sleep. My right. skin is burning. I am itching like crazy. I am so uncomfortable. I feel like I want to cry all the time. Mm. Can you please do a culture? Stop waiting for the dermatologist to ask. If you think you have an infection, say, I came here. I would like a culture done. Mm. And that could really help make a huge difference. I'm not saying that's going to solve everything because you still got stuff underneath. Right going on, but it could make a huge difference in your, your stress levels, in your sanity, in the damage done to your skin barrier. So don't be afraid to reach out for help when you really need it. I I just find a lot of people wait so long. And then once they get the antibiotics on their skin, they're like, oh my gosh, I am so much more comfortable. And now I can focus on actually like doing the work. Right. Oh, such a great point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to hit home with a lot of listeners. Um, Wow. Such good, valuable information. Girlfriend, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. And I'm just so impressed with your ability to pronounce (laughs) micropathogenic bacterias the way that you do. I can't even pronounce half of the vitamins and minerals appropriately. So I'm super (laughs) impressed with your ability. Just that's all you learn. No, it's amazing. (laughs) But no, seriously, I really am so grateful for you to be here and um, bring up some of these topics today that I think a lot of people are going to really, really connect with. So where can the listeners find you? What do you have going on right now? Any fun stuff? Well, I always have the Healthy Skin Show going on. It's a I, it sometimes is twice a week. Right now it's once a week podcast. Um, okay. We've got like a hundred and 
almost 60 episodes. So there's That's a amazing. ton of information for people to dig through and listen to. Um, and they can find me over at Skin Interrupt. I'm on Instagram as, as you had shared. And also too, for anybody who's like, oh my gosh, that root cause list. I'll, I'm like, I'm getting agita. <laughs> you know, my heart is pounding right. listening to you list out 16 things. I have also a really great, um, a thing called a skin rash root cause finder. It's a, Ooh. it's like a long document. It's like 12 pages long, okay. but you can go through it. It's a little quiz okay. and you can check off all the different symptoms. So I'm looking system wide and it'll help you focus and help you figure out what those root causes are. So it's a okay. really great, cause I do that for clients and I was like, how can I make this mm-hmm. more accessible for more people? And that right. was the way that I've done it. Yeah. So I use it in workshops and all sorts of things. And I'm happy to also share that with your listeners who want to finally start digging deeper. Absolutely. And I'll make sure that we link how to find you and all of the resources in the show notes to make it easy for everybody. I really, truly appreciate your knowledge, your ability to so clearly articulate in a very digestive way, this challenging information that is so beneficial to get out there so people can start, um, you know, deciding what is going to be the best route for them sooner than later. So keep doing all the things you're doing. You're helping to improve the world. I am so, so grateful for the opportunity to um, chat with you today and look forward to staying connected. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate everybody who tuned in today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Make sure you leave a review and let me know what you think. I love reading your feedback. Come hang out with me on Instagram at Heather Duranja. And don't forget to take a screenshot that you're listening to the podcast and tag me. I love to share it. See you on the next episode.